This series is entitled Exodus or The Biblical Moses That Hollywood Forgot. There have been many different iterations of the story of Moses in Hollywood history, beginning in 1927 with Cecil B. DeMille's first version of the Ten Commandments, and of course, Charlton Heston, 1950s. And of course, this particular series, this particular film, this particular representation of Moses resonates with me in a way that no other presentation does, which is why I begin this series with that iconic and so memorable music. I think it's the best score that's ever been written uh, in Hollywood history. Um, with all my compliments to John Williams and all of his great things, I think uh, Bernstein's composition for the Ten Commandments wins them all. I was taken as a child to see the re-release of the Ten Commandments. 1973, they re-released. In those days, they would do that. They would take great films of the past, and every 20 years or so, they would re-release them for a new audience before they released them on TV and showed them every year. Of course, this one is watched every year on TV and gets boffo ratings um, every year and has done so for, I don't know, 40 or so years now. But in 1973, where they re-released it, and my mother was taking me out to a, a, a movie uh, matinee that afternoon, and there were two films that uh, were playing that she thought I might be interested in. We had been doing, she was my Sunday school teacher at the time, and uh, we had been studying the life of Moses, and she thought I might be interested in seeing a movie about Moses. Uh, and so that was one choice. Uh, and the other choice was uh, um, uh, Willy Wonka uh, and the uh, Chocolate Factory, Gene Wilder. And I, I really had to ponder uh, the two, because I hadn't seen either. I mean, this is before Oompa Loompas entered the common vernacular of, of children everywhere. I didn't know what uh, I would find, but I did know that uh, I'd seen the commercials for Willy Wonka. Ah, it looked okay, but I also had seen the commercials for uh, the Ten Commandments. And Moses had always captured my imagination as a uh, seven eight-year-old child, and so I asked my mom to take me to the Ten Commandments, and, uh, and from the moment that those iconic chords, that first boom, boom, ba, ba, boom, began to play, I was immediately enthralled. And of course, the moment that Charlton Heston walks uh, onto the screen, um, I was captured with the story of Moses for life. Moses, of course, is the towering personality of the Hebrew scriptures and his massive shadow falls over not only the five books that he authored, we call it the Pentateuch or the Torah, but over the entirety of the Hebrew scripture. The prince of Egypt, the shepherd, the prophet, the mediator, the sea parter is at the core of both Judaism and his identity as both the proto-prophet and lawgiver par excellence and also at the core of Christianity. In his role as the typological, the prophetic image progenitor of Messiah, of Yeshua. He is the prophet, who, Yeshua is the prophet like Moses, that Moses spoke of in Deuteronomy 18. And capturing the imagination of both the casual and committed believer alike, Moses' status as an iconic figure has only increased with the passage of, oh, 3,500 uh, years. Popular films like Ten Commandments, uh, perennially viewed by millions, and of course cartoons like Prince of Egypt, I, I Love Them Both, have only added fuel to the iconic fire. Who could hear the name of Moses and not immediately conjure up this image in our mind's eye? Chuck Heston regally extending his staff over the roiling waters of the Red Sea, and majestically striding forward to lead the multitudes out of Egypt. But Hollywood's efforts didn't begin with Cecil B. DeMille or uh, the 1927 or even the 1956 version. They didn't end with him either. 
Burt Lancaster did a, a film on Moses in the 70s, not so hot. Um, ben Kingsley did one in the 80s for uh, TNT, that was okay. Of course, the cartoon Prince of Egypt, Val Kilmer, uh, his voice, uh, but uh, the animation, fabulous. My favorite film of all time, number one, Ten Commandments. This is a little trivia for you. Ten Commandments, number two, Prince of Egypt. This, uh, uh, Mo Moses captures the first and second slot, the top ten, uh, and there's no competition. And of course, uh, we had an ABC miniseries on the Ten Commandments in the 90s. Ah, it wasn't so great to me. Uh, and then most recently, we had uh, Roma Downey uh, do a Moses segment uh, in the uh, series, miniseries, The Bible. Of course, this looks less uh, Heston-like, authoritative, and more like a guy saying, after 40 years in the wilderness, I still can't figure out the directions. What do you say, Aaron? Which way should we go? Uh, that's what, that's that, that image to me. <laughs> but, and then, of course, the latest, but not the greatest by far, Christian uh, Bale's uh, <laughs> uh, contribution multi-million dollar, visually stunning, emotionally flat, and ultimately disappointing event. Although, well, Bale does hold a bow and arrow quite convincingly, uh, but when it comes down to uh, confronting Pharaoh, um, I found him a little bit wanting. Putting Batman in that position might not have been the best strategic move that Ridley Scott could have done, because once... Uh, Christian Bale confronts Pharaoh, and he says, let my people go. Pharaoh says, uh, I, I, I can't understand. What? What did he say? Uh, <clears throat> and, uh, and that's why he's got to repeat himself uh, nine more times until finally the movie gets going. Uh, but uh, that's what happens when you stick Batman in. But it's essential. When you approach a study of the book of Exodus, which we're going to do for the rest of the year, we're going to be living in Exodus. We have to separate the media's presentation from the actual recorded facts of Moses' own account. It's autobiographical after all, right? His own account of the events that surround his life. Because it's within the text of Exodus that we find, and only in the text, none of the films, no matter how marvelous uh, they, they are, They've all fallen short of the glory of the man's life contained within the word. No one's actually followed the actual story of the text contained in Exodus and thereafter. But within this text, we find a man of, of such great complexity, of interest, of, of humanity, and, and, and grandeur as well. And it far surpasses our own popular conceptions or Hollywood's best technicolor notions. As we go through this series, not every week, but many, many of the weeks, I'm going to be taking a clip of one of the uh, films of Moses, presenting Moses' life, and I'll either use it to illustrate or I'll compare and contrast, well, this is how Hollywood presented it, this is what the text actually says. Because within the biblical text, we meet a prince, Moses, who in the prime of life is, well, he's well aware of his unique destiny as the deliverer of his people. I know for dramatic purposes, most of the film presentations um, make it a big surprise about halfway through or one third of the way through. Moses, you're a Hebrew. What? Um, and it's a bit, but that's not the way it is in the text, and this man has been aware since childhood of his unique destiny, and so boldly, yet prematurely, he acts to set that grand destiny in motion, and well, it doesn't work out so well, and we're soon introduced to a later version of this man who's no longer royalty, he's now an obscure shepherd, a man humbled by his life, and humbled by circumstance who's now reluctant, gun-shy, if you will, to endorse his destiny, even upon a supernatural encounter, even upon divine instruction. Within his narrative struggles, we observe this man grow in faith and confidence 
and power as he fulfills his divine destiny, and finally becoming not only his people's deliverer, but also their shepherd, their mediator. And not once in the text does Moses' self-portrait yield to a heroic self-caricature. He remains, as he presents himself, all too human. We saw that in our Torah reading today. He is all too human. We see all the flaws. Throughout the Exodus narrative and, well, throughout the remainder of the Pentateuch. Well, let's get into the introduction of the text itself. Let's talk about title. Uh, Hebrew titles for the books of the Bible generally derive, not a lot of creativity here, generally derived from the initial word or phrase of each respective volume in Hebrew. The book is named after the first two words, uh, Vela Shemot. These are the names. So Shemot, names, same phrase occurs in Genesis 46, where it introduces a list of Israelite immigrants to Egypt. One manner in which Moses stylistically connects Genesis to Exodus. So names, our uh, English title is Exodus based upon the Greek title Exodus, the exit. By the way, um, it's really important when you're driving in Greece to be a biblical scholar uh, because if you want to find the exit for any highway that you're going, you want to look for the sign that says Exodus, okay? Um, that's how you find, that's how you know it's time to get off the road. So Exodus, departure, okay, or exit. And the authorship, of course, um, comes down to a real question. Does Exodus, the rest of the Torah, have a single author, or is it a Frankenstein monster? Are there several layers of textual tradition, three, four, uh, or more, that underlie the book's final form that some uh, later redactor, some later editor uh, took like body parts and stitched together into a giant Frankenstein monster that could be really unreliable for us to be able to trust that Moses is the... Or is Moses the actual author? There is strong evidence, of course, for Moses himself to be the author. It's not a Frankenstein monster. And the first reason that we should trust that Moses is the author of Exodus are the internal claims of the book itself. It claims to be the work of Moses. A second reason is that as the prince of Egypt, who was thoroughly educated in the Egyptian arts and sciences, Moses was completely qualified to have written the books that are ascribed to him. The third reason is that other biblical books assume Mosaic authorship, Deuteronomy, Joshua, uh, Nehemiah, 1 Kings. And a final compelling reason and this, is, this should settle it for us, is that Jesus certainly accepted Mosaic authorship of Exodus. He quoted from Exodus. He ascribed the authorship to Moses. Therefore, there is no reason to doubt that the initial composition dates to a post-wilderness wandering period. Right? So not only has the authorship been an issue of controversy, but the date of the events of the Exodus generation has also engendered a variety of debate. And the main question is whether it dates to the 13th century, in other words, to 1290, which is considered the late date. That's the date that the movies uh, primarily take. Almost all the movies take this late date where Ramses is the Pharaoh, or if it's the early date, which dates to the 15th century, 1446. Well, what's the difference between a date of 1290 and a date of 1446? I don't know, you do the math. I'm not a mathematician, I'm a theologian. Uh, but nonetheless, it's important, uh, and we can trust uh, that it's not the late date. The only arguments for the late date is that uh, we find archaeologically this widespread 13th century devastation uh, in Egypt and in some of the uh, area of Canaan. Um, 
and apparently there is a lack of 15th century devastation commensurate with what's described in the book of Exodus and in the book of Joshua, the conquest. Well, to which I say, if there is a lack of evidence, um, it simply means that it hasn't been discovered yet. It doesn't mean that it's not there, right? An absence uh, of, 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 the, uh, of the evidence right now doesn't mean that it will always be absent, right? So, uh, and then of course, that the Jewish people built the city of Ramses, right? As if there couldn't be this name floating out before Pharaoh Ramses, or as if someone later couldn't change the, date to, the, the name of the city that they had built to make it contemporary with uh, later events. So that's the only reasons to take a late event. Uh, the early date, 1446, is a lot of reasons to take 1446, and first of which is the testimony of Scripture. The testimony of Scripture, it tells us, according to 1 Kings 6.1, when Solomon began the construction of the temple in Jerusalem, it tells us that the period between the Exodus and the fourth year of Solomon's reign, when he began building the, uh, the, the temple, when he constructed the temple, was 480 years. We know that the temple began in 966. Construction began 480 years backwards, brings us to 1446. Plus the fact that we have Egyptian archaeological evidence. There is some evidence that uh, leads us to believe that there was a group of slaves who... Uh, nomadically disappeared very, very quickly from there. And then the last reason, and I think this was an interesting one, <coughs> is that the, the pharaoh of 1446 was not succeeded by his firstborn. Obviously, the, uh, the standard way of succession is for the firstborn. Something must have happened to the firstborn of Pharaoh because it's a later son who takes over. One can certainly say this fits the dates, this fits the evidence that the book presents. When we talk about the timeline, we're talking about Moses being born somewhere around, this is the later date, we're taking the early date, 1526, Moses is born, Moses is kicked out of Egypt, he flees Egypt, uh, 1486, the exodus occurs 40 years later, and then the Jewish people enter into Canaan 1406. So that's the timeline from which we're we're working. The biblical background of Genesis, of, uh, of Exodus, is Genesis. So Genesis, very important, Genesis provides the foundation for interpreting the book of Exodus. When we talk about Genesis, we're speaking primarily of the Abrahamic covenant. And the Abrahamic covenant is the key to understanding a great deal of the key events that are recorded within Exodus. And certainly the Abrahamic covenant um, provides the motivation for every action of God throughout the entire book. One component of the Abrahamic covenant is the promise of reciprocal blessing and cursing in regard to oh, behavior toward Abraham's covenant posterity, the Jewish people. You remember this from Genesis 12, 3. I will bless those that bless you, and I will curse the one who curses you. This is <coughs> like holy karma, you know, but uh, retributive justice is the theological concept. And we see this within the book of Exodus. This is why Egypt was so blessed by God as one pharaoh blessed Joseph and his family, and why, conversely, Egypt is divinely smitten following a long succession of pharaohs who expressed quite a different disposition, shall we say, to the Jewish people. Nestled within the Abrahamic covenant's promise of Abraham's descendants in the land of Canaan, is a divine warning, it's Genesis 15, that before the Hebrews, before Israel, is going to possess the promised land, they're first going to experience a fourth century sojourn. And that sojourn will be a sojourn of affliction in a foreign land. And reassurance is given that, well, that will come to an end. And upon the Hebrews' departure, 
They will possess great wealth, and their afflictors will be divinely judged for how they treated the Jewish people. And the reason for the Hebrews' 400-year absence from the land of promise that God had given Abraham in, in Genesis, that's tacked on as a coda. And I quote the Word of God, who says, the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. So you see, you needed a lengthy Egyptian sojourn out of the land so that when the Hebrews return to violently, and that's how it's going to go, they're going to violently dispossess the inhabitants of Canaan, the Canaanites are certain to receive the divine justice that is due for their abominable sins. It will take 400 years for the actions of the conquest to be considered by God to be just. In a later portion of Genesis, Moses provides a related, more subtle insight into the necessity of the Egyptian sojourn. The story of Joseph. Where is Joseph found? It's in the final third of the book of Genesis. Right? If we look at Genesis and do chunks out of Genesis, final third, all about Joseph. It's abruptly interrupted, right there, following the arrival of Joseph into Egypt, and all of a sudden, you've got this other account that interrupts. It's like a parenthesis right in the middle of the story of Joseph. This unexpected insertion only makes sense in its particular location, where Moses put it, if one recognizes that the point of that passage is to highlight the chain of problematic events that begin to arise when the sons of Jacob, contrary to the practice of the patriarchs of Abraham and Isaac, and Jacob, they begin to intermarry with local Canaanite women. We are reminded right here by Moses in Genesis that the Hebrews would need to be protected from the corrosive influence of the Canaanite local population. And the way that God is going to protect the Jewish people from the corrosive influence of the Canaanites who are there during the time of Abraham, Isaac, and, and Jacob, is to physically, but temporarily, remove every Hebrew from Canaan and deposit them wholesale into Egypt. <coughs> and that's a matrix that's going to serve to preserve their faith. And it will incubate the identity of God's people over time until they multiply and the matrix of Egypt into a mighty nation. The final issue of background we find in Genesis is the prophecy of Jacob. Genesis provides reassurance to the Hebrew people that their time in Egypt is divinely superintended, that it's God who made them go to Egypt. It is God who designed the circumstances for them to be in Egypt for a lengthy period of time. And it is for their benefit. And it's only temporary. And this reassurance was clearly understood by Joseph's deathbed request that his bones accompany the Hebrews upon their eventual exodus from Egypt and back into the land of promise. They expected from Joseph and the patriarchs on forward, because of what Jake, Jacob prophesied, that they would indeed return to their own land. Well, we talk about the theme of this book. Let's talk about the theme of the book very quickly. Uh, the purpose of Exodus was to provide an explanation and a description. You needed both explanation and description as to precisely how the chosen people become the chosen people. And so Exodus provides for us a redemptive roadmap that carries the interested reader along a journey of the Jewish people from bitter bondage to glorious freedom as a nation is born 
the message of the book, well, Exodus is far more than just a, an extraordinary family history of the Jewish people. Exodus records a timeless and universal story of hope and of liberation and of redemption. Moses' account provides to Jews and to Gentiles of every generation. That means from the Exodus generation all the way forward to us now, 3,500 years later, provides conclusive proof of God's one willingness and God's ability to intervene in the course of human history on behalf of his people and in fulfillment of his promises. It's one thing to have a willingness to act, but if you don't have the power to back that up, willingness is just cheap talk and emotion. But the God that Moses introduces us to in Torah has both willingness and ability to act, to intervene, to insert himself into human history. How come? Because he keeps his promises and because he loves his people. Well, in this book, we have a foundational theology. And in this theology, God reveals his sacred name. He reveals his attributes. He reveals his redemption, his Torah. And, frankly, a minutely detailed and how description of how he is to be worshipped by his chosen people. It tells us about the appointment of the first covenant mediator, Moses. Describes the origin of the priesthood defines the role of prophets, and relates how the ancient covenant relationship between God and his people, the dispensation of promise, the era of promise, inaugurates a new relationship at Mount Sinai, which is a dispensation, an era of law, of Torah. Speaking of theology, the theology of God that we learn from this book that is designed by Moses to serve as a permanent written legacy for his people. Well, necessarily studied through Exodus are profound insights into the nature of God. It begins with the very assumption of God's existence as the I am. God's nature is ultimate and eternal. Moses paints a multifaceted portrait of a divine being with infinite power, inestimable attributes. There is none like our God. If you come away, having read Exodus, thinking that the God of the Hebrews is like any other God from any other religion, go back and read it again because you've missed it. The God of Moses controls the reins of history and turns the reins of history, boom, as he will, like turning a horse one way or another or steering your automobile. God steers history as he wills. And he adjusts historical events and the natural order by his command. He is a holy God, a holy God of such transcendence that to behold his glory in its full power, in its fullness, would prove fatal. A God of such holiness and transcendence that he demands that his people relate to him in light of his holiness. Our God is a God of righteous absolutes. And because he is a God of righteous absolutes, there are eternal 
ethical truths, moral rights and wrongs that remain true no matter what society, what culture, what era one is in. Righteous absolutes that provides a legal roadmap for his people to follow in his paths. Deviation from God's standards of righteous demands requires divine judgment. Exodus gives us the God who sees all, the God who observes all, the God who hears all, yet he is no passive observer, content to view history from afar. He's a God who takes action, who intimately involves himself in the affairs of men on behalf of his people. When does he do so? Whenever he divinely desires. His motivation to action is none other than his identity as the covenant-keeping God who remembers his promises and who keeps his commitments. The God of Moses is not some inscrutable, unknowable God, but he is knowable because he directly communicates with his people. He makes his will Known to They don't have to guess what the will of God is because he makes his will known to them in very specific terms. He's a personal God who enters into an intimate relationship with his people. If you miss the intimate relationship that God desires to have with Israel as expressed throughout Exodus, you miss a large component of what Moses is, is, is communicating about God. He responds to personal conversation. How does he respond? Passionately. He responds emotionally. He reveals himself. He discusses his feelings and his desires and his disappointments and his anger with Moses and with his people. And he argues with Moses. Furthermore, he's a God who answers prayer and who responds to the intercession of his people. He's a God whose love for his people is so exceptional that he locally manifests himself in their midst. He doesn't remain aloof from them. He comes down to be with them that he might personally, physically dwell among the children of Israel. And interestingly, Moses also provides the insight that the focus of God's concern surpasses that of just his own people, Israel, and extends to the nations as well. In Exodus, the reader sees God concerned with creating and maintaining a reputation among the nations, specifically Egypt and Exodus. He, he repeatedly acts and, and reacts to events that occur in the text with an eye toward how his actions will play on the Egyptian street. Finally, Exodus reveals the monumental salvation of the Lord. The sequential events of the Passover, the Exodus, the parting of the Red Sea, they combine to become the second greatest redemptive event the world has ever known surpassed in magnitude and consequence only by the sequential events of the death, burial, and resurrection of our Messiah, Yeshua. And we, today, continue to be affected by the repercussions of the Exodus events. It is these very events which, about 1,500 years later, will eventually yield... Messianic redemption. 
In fact, both John the Baptist and the Apostle Paul viewed the death of Yeshua as the fulfillment of the Passover, as we experienced in communion just today. So Exodus provides for us a brilliant roadmap of history, of theology, of, uh, of culture. It is not just historical information that's nice to know. Everything that flows through the Bible all the way up to including and surpassing death, burial, and resurrection of our Messiah flows as a result of the events that are described in Exodus. So we have together a tremendous ride to take. So in the weeks that follow, what I suggest that you do, <coughs> first of all, is if you want to read my, uh, well, you don't read it, you listen to it, it's an audio commentary. Uh, if you want to listen to the, um, it's called From God's, uh, From the Ten Commandments to Gods and Kings, the Biblical Moses that Hollywood Forgot. Um, if you want to listen to it, six hours of uh, commentary on the life of Moses, all the autobiographical, it's only 31 uh, chapters in the whole Torah that, are, uh, that contain autobiographical information regarding the life of Moses, and that will take you through. So that's one way to prepare for the rest of the year that we're going to be spending in Exodus. We will be living in Exodus. So that's number one. Number two, read the book. Read the book of Exodus. Read it once, read it twice, read it three times. Um, the third time is generally the time that you begin to say, oh, I didn't see that before. Right? So that would be a great way. Uh, and another way, and final way, is for you to be here every week with your seat belts buckled um, and ready to study the text together. Uh, the last time I preached this message, I shared with you uh, the Egyptian background. Uh, we're going to leave that out for time right now, but if you want to go back and hear the audio <coughs> of the Egyptian background, that, I believe, is, uh, is still on the website, is, uh, is a, an audio presentation that you can hear uh, the last, I don't know, 10 minutes of the message or so, as we talk about the Egyptian history, the background, the chronology, leading up the pharaohs and uh, who Moses' mommy was and, uh, and all these uh, kinds of things uh, dealing with Egyptian chronology, Egyptian history. So that's available on audio. But for right now, I want to leave you with the idea of exploring the personality the actions, the events that, serve, that surround the life of Moses. One more thing you can do to prepare, go back and peruse Genesis. Not the stories in the first 11 chapters, Adam and Eve and Noah's Ark, and those are all prologue. You know, the first 11 chapters, Genesis, that's like prologue to the main story. That's like the setup to get you uh, prepared to specifically enter into the family chronology, the family saga that begins in Genesis chapter 12. And so from Genesis chapter 12 all the way through the end, you begin to see all the areas, especially the Abrahamic covenant, repeated and repeated and repeated over and over again. And mark all the promises in the Abrahamic covenant because they're all going to be recognized, they're all going to be addressed in Exodus, that's what Moses is very conscientious to do for us. So that's another way to prepare. So let's close our uh, eyes and have a moment of prayer. And then we have some announcements for you. You don't want to miss the announcements. Our Father and our God, we thank you so much for providing your word for us. A testimony that doesn't really read like ancient history. It doesn't read like so many of the Near Eastern documents uh, that are contemporary with it, but as a timeless account that is uh, relevant not just to ancient Hebrews, but to the Jewish people throughout time, and not just the Jewish people, but all people.
Because we are all brothers. And your son has died for each one of us and has exhibited his power, exhibited his power to forgive our sins and to reconcile ourselves to you through his resurrection and ascension. So Lord, bless our excursion, our expedition into the book of Exodus as we explore the biblical Moses that Hollywood forgot. May our study find fertile ground in our hearts and in our minds and in our mouths to share. In the name of Yeshua we pray. Amen. Thank you.